Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Marie, and I am happy to welcome you to Bay Park. We are glad that you are here with us, both online and in person. Before we sing together, um, listen to the words of Psalm 100, where David talks about how to worship and give grateful praise to God. It reads, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, these words of David remind us, remind us of so many important truths about you. That you made us, therefore you know us be better than anyone else ever could. That we are yours, your people, and there is no greater comfort than knowing that we belong to you. That we are the sheep of your pasture and that you will lead us and care for us and protect us. That your love endures forever, it is not bound by time, and that your faithfulness continues through all generations. You are reliable and steadfast, and your word is unchanging and true. Fill our hearts this morning with gladness and with voices that shout for joy, as David says, because of who you are and what you have done through us, for us through your Son. And as we lift our voices now in grateful praise, may your Holy Spirit draw us near to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Marie. Church, you can be you can stand with us. We're gonna sing.
you may be seated. As Marie comes up and we continue in in our service, would that be our prayer that we would ask our eyes and heart to be open? Well, welcome again. Um, for those of you who are new, we would love to get to know you. In the pew rack in front of you, there's a little laminated card with a QR code on it, and it will send you to an online form where you can tell us a little bit about yourself. And as a thank you for coming, after the service, please head to the welcome desk in the foyer um, where you can say hello and find a selection of books for you to choose from as our gift to you. We want to thank you, church, for your continued generosity. Giving is one of the marks of Christian living, and it happens with our time, with our talents, and with our treasures, and it has an impact on both those near and far. We just had another appeal from our Feb Central missionaries in Poland who are supporting the refugees that are coming um, out of Ukraine. And in response, our missions committee has stepped forward to give $5,000 more to this need. So if, yes. <laughs> so if you are um, wanting to partner in giving, the links will go out in our Staying Connected email. For serving those who are near to us, we are so excited to be running our backpack drive again this year. Um, once a year, we ask Bay Parkers to donate a backpack and or a $25 gift card to Walmart, and we will take these gift cards to purchase school supplies um, to fill the backpacks. And then they are distributed to the families in our community who need a little extra support. And this is a way that we can practically serve our community as well as pray for each family and child that signs up. Finally, Freedom Session will be starting up again uh, in October on Wednesday the 19th, and it will be running in person from 6.30 to 8.30 at Bay Park. It is a 28-week course that starts with a video in a large group setting and then breaks up into smaller groups for discussion. And I'm going to invite Nancy Pike up to share a little bit more about Freedom Session. Well, good morning to you all. Again, my name is Nancy, and I'm excited to share with you about the Ministry of Freedom Session that happens here at Bay Park. It is a discipleship program that helps you walk through your life to reveal the way that the Lord has worked in your life, as well as bring to light the areas in your life where the world, the flesh, or the devil has formed our identity. And then it guides the participant to uh, look to Jesus for your wholeness, your identity and healing and knowing and becoming more like Christ. So some may ask, who is Freedom Session for? And in my opinion, it is for everyone. Because the reality is, is that we are all sinners, you and I alike. And just like I have hurt others and sinned against others and others have done so with me, healing is required. And Jesus is the ultimate healer who brings eternal freedom in healing. So last year I went through the Freedom Session program and I wish that I could tell you at the end of the program that uh, I was completely cured of my anger, of my selfishness, of my habitual sins, of my jealousy, of my bitterness, and the list goes on. But unfortunately, walking a daily walk with Jesus means that I have a daily choice to either follow Jesus or, in my own strength, follow my own desires. And so Freedom Session has helped me lay a foundation of truth to find my identity and freedom in Jesus and Jesus alone and to help reveal the sinful tendencies that I am prone to each and every day and instead find freedom in Jesus. So John 10.10 10 says this very clearly, that the devil is out with one purpose, to steal, kill, and destroy. And I don't know about you, but for me, that is a daily battle that I face. But the verse doesn't end there. It says that Jesus' purpose 
is to bring life and life in its full. So Freedom Session helped me face my fear or fears. It revealed the lies that I believe about myself. It brought to light the sin that I continually engage in. It, it broke, it helped break the guilt and shame, shame that continually invaded my mind. I learned through the process of Freedom Session how to replace the lies with truth and how to confess my sins in trusted community and what it looked like to break the bondage of guilt and shame through the forgiveness and power and freedom in Jesus. See, I, Nancy Pike, am a broken human. And I live in a broken world alongside other broken humans. And the reality is that I have sinned against others and others have sinned against me and I have hurt others and others have hurt me and I have lied to others and others have lied to me. But through the power of Jesus and Jesus alone, my sins have been forgiven. And Freedom Session has allowed me to lay truth as a foundation so that I can daily walk in freedom and following Christ alone. It has been an amazing journey and a great tool for me in my walk with Jesus each and every day. Some days are better than others, as I'm sure you all know well. So if you want to know more about Freedom Session and uh, what it kind of looks like, please feel free to talk with me. I'm more than happy uh, to talk with you about what Freedom Session is. Feel free to uh, email Robin Dwyer, call the church office, or even Google Freedom Session and look at their website. Well, Marie, I think that's all for me. Back over to you. Thanks for sharing, Nancy. Let's stand together. Adults, take some time to say hello to someone. Ask them how their summer has been. And kids, you can head to your classes at the back with Tracy, Allie, Beth, and Mrs. Johnson.
Well, after you said hello to a neighbor, I'm going to invite you to stand and we're going to continue to sing together. And I think throughout this service, hopefully you will see that we have woven the gospel. And so if I was to ask you, what is the gospel in your heart, in your mind, can you think through what is it? And this morning we get to celebrate and remember that Jesus is the one who died for our sin, that in him we have freedom and hope and forgiveness through his death, burial, and resurrection. And so this song, we can use it to prepare our hearts for communion. We're going to be taking that later on. And really, truly, to just reflect. Maybe it's that awe of response of who Jesus is, God in flesh, and what he's done for us. So let's sing it out, church. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior all. That cursed tree. His body bowed and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy soul. Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name. and verse one more time we're gonna I'm gonna invite you to close your eyes and we're gonna take just a moment to pray through maybe you can thank Jesus for what he's done remembering his work on the cross the death burial and resurrection and 
sometimes when you see Jesus and recognize his holiness, his authority, it also helps me anyway see my sin, all the places where I'm broken and hurt. And maybe this is a time to say, you know, Jesus, here are, here's where I'm struggling. Here is this issue, this situation. Can you do your work of healing and restoring, of forgiveness? In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul says, For what I received I passed on to you of the first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he raised, was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And church, this is what gives us great hope. Let's sing this last verse together. He shall return in a robes of white, the blazing sun. Jesus, this morning we praise you. We recognize what you've done and we look to you for our hope. This morning we pray that we hear from you. We know that you are the word of God enfleshed and that's what it says in John 1 and so we remember and realize that we are looking to hear from you, the living God, this morning. And so as Tim comes up and preaches from your active and powerful word, would it pierce our hearts? Would it encourage and strengthen? Would it build us up, but would it also make us more into your image and likeness? And so even that, we surrender to your word and we hear with open ears in the work you're wanting to do in us and in your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Well, thank you, Rachel and team, for once again just reminding us of all the reasons we have to celebrate the goodness and the grace of our God. Well, good morning online and in person, Bay Park. It's great to uh, open God's Word together uh, again with you this morning. Let me invite you to turn with me in your Bibles or on your devices to 1 Kings uh, chapter 7 as we continue on in this series on the life of, the, of Elijah entitled uh, Detour. And uh, if you are new to Christianity or new to the Bible, there is a Bible in the pew here uh, at Bay Park, and uh, you'll find that text on page 282 in the pew Bible. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, we'd love for you to take that with you and call it your own, write your name in the front, and uh, just uh, receive that as a gift, our way of saying thank you for joining us for worship. We know it takes courage to uh, explore a, a new church relationship, and we are so, so glad that you're here. All right, well, we are in week two of this series entitled Detour, and last week, one of the things that we learned um, is that detours are almost inevitable in our lives. If, if you've lived a couple of decades or more, you know this to be true, and we also learned that detours come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Sometimes they come in the context of of unexpectedly broken relationships, um, divorces. Sometimes they come in the context of, of pink slips or financial failures. Sometimes they, they come in the form of 
uh, unexpected uh, health journeys, uh, mental health, physical health, diagnoses that we just didn't see uh, coming. And, and the, the question that we're asking throughout this series is, how do we navigate those detours in our lives as followers of Jesus Christ and still reach the destination that, that God has for us? How do we navigate those twists and turns in the road and not end up in the ditch or at the end of a dead-end road at the end of our life? Well, the title of this morning's message is simply uh, Dangerous Drives. And uh, this morning, I'd like to begin by asking us a, a few questions on the, the subject of risk. First question is simply this, what's your appetite for risk? Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being if your family is visiting Canada's Wonderland, you're the person at the front row of the Yukon striker with your hands up, screaming the whole way. All right, so we have some tens in the congregation and online. Maybe you can put this in the chat. On the other end of the scale, number one, you would be that noble person in the group who is waiting patiently with the backpacks and the water bottles <laughs> and nobly taking photos of the rest of the group. All right, thank you. We need you. We can't all be at that other end of the scale. All right, so we now know our risk profile as a congregation. It's not bad. It's not bad at all. Second question for you this morning is, what's your appetite for spiritual risk? When was the last time God called you to do something really risky, really dangerous for the kingdom of God, and how did you respond? Think about that uh, for just a moment. Third and final question is, do you have a theology of risk? And if so, what is your theology of risk. I'd never even heard the term until about four or five, six years ago when in my context we started to introduce it to our missionary staff as part of their pre-field uh, preparation training. And we actually introduced it to them in the context of a, a three-day course on security training to really um, prepare them well for life and uh, ministry overseas. This course is taught by a a group out of the U.S., it's a group of former uh, Army Rangers and U.S. Marines that prepare our people well for life and ministry overseas. And they begin with a theology of risk, helping us to understand the, how to manage that tension between our fears and our faith when God calls us to do something that has the potential to raise our blood pressure. So this April, I had the opportunity to be a part of that training in Guelph at our, at our home office, and uh, this is a, a picture of the course. It's, it's kind of small there. Um, you, you may notice that I'm the not-so-smart guy in the gray hoodie there on the ground with his head up. My head should have been down, which is why I also have a couple of guns pointed at my head. And one of the lessons that, that I learned in that training exercise was, you know, they don't call you a martyr overseas if you die for a really dumb reason. I mean... We, uh, we learned a few things about what risks are worth taking and what certainly are not uh, worth taking. So have you ever considered your own theology of risk? And what kinds of things you'd be willing to risk um, for the cause of Jesus Christ? Maybe it's your comfort. Maybe it's your financial stability. Uh, maybe it's the closeness of the relationship that you have with family. Well, this morning we catch up with Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17 when he, uh, for the first time, uh, encounters King Ahab and his theology of risk is ultimately put the, to the test in a pretty profound way. So let's pick up there in 1 Kings uh, chapter uh, 17 just in the first two verses to start. Now Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead, he said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will neither be dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. One of the first observations I'd like us to make as I work we work our way through the text this morning, is that God called Elijah to take on a, a pretty 
dangerous assignment right here in 1 Kings uh, chapter 17, verse 1. And that Simon, in essence, was to confront King Ahad and to declare this drought that God was going to bring upon the land. And there is a number of reasons why this was a dangerous assignment. I mean, for one, uh, Elijah is a no-name guy from a no-name town. And ultimately, God calls him to confront the king of Israel and, and in essence, Israel's commander-in-chief. Now, uh, Elijah doesn't get much of an introduction here in the text. There's no familial introduction. There's no reference to his father or his father's father. There's no reference to the tribe he was from. Um, there's no reference to his background at all. He's just a, a no-name guy, in essence, from a no-name town. We do have the name of that town. It's, it's Tishbe, but it is uh, off the beaten path um, in the region of Gilead. In fact, um, Bible commentators describe Tishbe in this way. It's a, a rugged, um, unsettled, half-civilized Transjordanian region. There's a picture of it if you want to get a feel for where Elijah was from. So he's this no-name guy from a no-name town, and God calls him to confront the king of Israel. This is the man at the top of the religious political leadership pyramid in the entire uh, country. A, a daunting uh, task for sure. You know, and back in the day, and just the same as today, you don't just walk into the palace uh, of the, cling, uh, the king and or prime minister or president today and declare judgment on that leadership. Um, and, and, and remember that Elijah in confronting Ahab wasn't just confronting any king, right? I mean, last week we learned about his reputation, the fact that his influence, you know, and his impact as a leader was, was captured in a, a couple epitaphs, the first of which is this, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than all of the kings that came before him. And we remember he, he earned that epitaph by introducing Baal worship to the people of Israel. He built this temple to Baal in the capital city. Um, he and his wife recruited all of these prophets, 450 prophets of Baal, um, into um, that, uh, that kingdom. In essence, they instituted Baal worship as the state religion in a direct violation of God's word and his will. So again, Elijah, no-name guy from a no-name town, called by God to confront the king of Israel, who just happens to be that king who did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than anyone else, that king who set up Baal worship as the new focal point of worship in all of Israel. How does Elijah introduce himself? Very simply, uh, as a servant of the Lord. He says, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next years except at my word. Unashamedly, unabashedly, Elijah introduces himself as a servant of the Lord. In fact, his name, uh, when translated, means Yahweh is my Lord. Can you gain an appreciation for some of the tension that is building in this showdown, in this confrontation between Elijah and Ahab? I mean, in many ways, this is looking more and more like a suicide mission. And in essence, the words that God called Elijah to, to speak into the life of King Ahab uh, were words of judgment, um, which you can imagine... Uh, had over the previous days uh, raised um, Elijah's blood pressure by a few notches, were assured. I mean, considered in this context, this was uh, tantamount to declaring personal judgment on King Ahab for abandoning the word of the Lord as leader of Israel. And in Deuteronomy 11, in fact, there had been a prophecy made about those kings who, who allowed the people of Israel to be distracted. To, uh, by idolatry, they could expect, in fact, that drought would come on the land and the people. And yet, um, 
That's exactly what Ahab uh, does. And so Elijah declares this judgment on the, the, on the influence of King Ahab. I mean, in some ways, this was also tantamount to declaring economic disaster on the land because, of course, it's an agrarian culture. I mean, they depended upon the rain for everything, for their own personal crops and well-being, but also their economy was fully dependent upon that. And in many ways, this, this declaration of judgment, it was like spitting in the face of Baal, right? I mean, Baal was the god of the thunderstorms, right? The god of fertility, the, the god who was ultimately responsible for the rain. And so God had clearly called Elijah to take on this incredibly dangerous assignment you ever considered the fact that God is still calling us as followers of Jesus Christ to take on dangerous assignments today? Have you ever considered the fact that God is, is calling us at times to take risks for the cause of Jesus Christ? Maybe in the context of uh, confronting someone in leadership at work over an unethical or an unsafe business practice, Maybe standing up for truth and the, the well-being of colleagues, which could be dangerous to your career at the end of the day. Maybe in the, the context of, of confronting a child uh, about who they're dating, what they're watching, what you find in their backpack or their bedroom, having a, a hard conversation with your kids about where they're at with the Lord. Could be dangerous to your relationship in the short term anyways. Maybe in the context of being um, called to step out of your faith and to share your faith with someone in your family or your neighborhood, your workplace, your school context. Maybe being called to, to reach out to at-risk youth or young adults or adults in our community in the context of foster care or ministry among the homeless. Or maybe even being called to serve Christ in a country which is hostile to the cause of Jesus Christ. I think God's still calling us at times to dangerous assignments in our own families, in our own communities, in this country and around the world. And so the question is, when that assignment comes, how will you and I respond? How will we balance that tension between our fears on the one hand, which are normal and natural, and our faith on the other. Well, the second observation I'd like us to make um, from the text this morning is, is simply from Elijah's own example. Notice that despite the danger, Elijah overcame his fears and he tackled this difficult assignment that God had called him to. And, and you know, we, we don't really get a window in his, into his emotional state at the time, but we can only expect that Elijah, like any one of us, you know, must have been shaking in his sandals uh, in, the, in the hours and in the days leading up to that confrontation after he'd received that call uh, of God upon his life. But the text simply tells us that he did what he was told by God. He accepted that calling and he stepped into the palace of King Ahab. We don't know how he got access. We don't know how that exactly played out. Uh, we don't know what his blood pressure was at the time, but I'm sure it was spiking. He simply followed the marching orders that God had given to him uh, at the time. And in that uh, simple obedience, we have a powerful example for, for us today as God calls us to take on dangerous assignments in our own lives. Will our fear overcome our faith? Or will our faith, like Elijah's, overcome our fear? Third observation that we can make um, from the text this morning is, is simply, uh, I want you to notice what follows Elijah's obedience and his response of faith. Notice that in that faithful response, in his obedience to taking on that dangerous assignment, God not only protected him, 
but God also provided for him in and through the rest of that assignment. And we see that in verses uh, 3 and following. Then the word of the Lord, so this is following his confrontation with King Ahab. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, the Lord said. Turn eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I've directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and he stayed there. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Interesting how we see uh, what, re- what follows Elijah's obedience. He didn't know what the future would hold. He didn't know if he would be in chains, immediately arrested. But immediately after that encounter, God uh, uh, scoops him away, sends him off to the Kareth Ravine. He, he knew that at this point in time, Elijah would have become public enemy number one um, in, in all of Israel. And so he sends him off to the Kareth Ravine. We've got a picture here that gives you a, an idea of where we believe that to be today. So this is a wadi um, out in the ancient Near East. So it's a kind of a dried up riverbed area where um, God would have sent him to, in essence, to protect him, to hide him away in the desert um, to, uh, in essence, keep him out of sight. And one of the things as we read forward in the text that we discover is that not long after this encounter, he did become public enemy number one in all of Israel. In fact, Ahab and, and more importantly his wife Jezebel went on a rampage to try to wipe out, to exterminate, to actually slaughter all of the prophets of Israel after that. Yet God put his protective hand on Elijah and hid him away so that his po- purposes could be accomplished um, in the weeks and months uh, to come. And I think that's an important reminder for us as we consider the risks that God calls us to take in our own journeys of life and faith, that we, we serve a God that has the capacity to protect us even in the, in the high-risk environments that he may call us to live our faith in. So may that be an encouragement to us as we look at the life of Elijah. Notice that God uh, protects him on the heels of his obedience. But also notice that God provides for him as well through this incredible series of means. I mean, yes, he sends him to the, the Kareth Ravine where there's a river, the Jabbok River, and so there was a water supply there in the desert. So, you know, his daily needs for hydration were taken care of, which is beautiful. But, but notice that he begins to work outside of the natural, in the supernatural, and he actually sends ravens to start feeding him day in and day out. And these ravens bring him breakfast in the morning, bread and meat, and then food in the evening. Once again, bread and meat. And he provides for his daily nourishment. And this is nothing short of supernatural, of course. Why? Because by their very nature, ravens, they're takers, right? I mean, they're, they're sort of scavenger birds. They're birds of prey. They kill, they devour, they scavenge for pretty much whatever they can get their beaks on. Um, they're even known at times to neglect their own young. They're certainly not birds that provide and protect. And so here in this example, in the wake of Elijah's obedience, we see this beautiful example of God not only protecting Elijah, but also providing him in a pretty profound way. And we tend to think, you know, skip the dishes is pretty good. I don't think it holds anything compared to what Elijah experienced uh, at that point in time. And so remember this. If God is calling you to a, a dangerous assignment, remember that the God we serve, the God of Abraham and Jacob and, and uh, all of those who have followed um, after our God is the one who can not only protect us, but provide for our needs as we uh, follow his lead and step into the assignments that he places before us. And, and I think that's the reason why God has, has captured this um, part of 
Elijah's journey for us in 1 Kings chapter 17. Ultimately, uh, to remind us that when God calls us to take on dangerous assignments, that he can also provide and, and protect us through means through which we can't even imagine. I, I think that may be the point of this passage uh, to remind us that, that when God calls us um, to take on dangerous assignments, he can also protect us and provide for our needs through supernatural means, through ways that we can't even imagine. Now, I think we need to pause for just a moment and talk a little bit about the reality of martyrdom. I mean, if you studied martyrdom over the years, you know that there's a historical record of those who have taken on dangerous assignments for the cause of Jesus Christ, and they're, they're no longer with us. They've given their lives. And I, I think in all honesty, we have to recognize that it's not always God's plan to ultimately protect our lives. Um, sometimes the calling to give our lives is a divinely choreographed calling for the kingdom of God and the purposes of God. And that is an incredibly sacred thing. But it's also an unusual thing. And more often than not, as we look at uh, church history, at, as we look at even our own lives, we recognize that as God calls us to these dangerous assignments, more often he chooses to provide for us and protect us in and through those assignments. So let me ask us this question this morning. What, what dangerous roads might God be calling you and I to drive down in our lives? More importantly, how will we respond to that calling uh, when it comes are you convinced that in that calling, God can not only protect you, but also provide for you through means you may not even a be able to imagine? As you consider these questions this morning, receive this challenge from the great Baptist missionary, William Carey, who first penned these words in 1792. He said, expect great things from God Attempt great things for God. Expect great things for God. And out of that, attempt great things for God. A year later, after writing that sermon, uh, William Carey and his wife and their three kids would board a ship uh, for India where he would dedicate much of his life to translating the New Testament in Bengali. And so he not only preached it, but he practiced what he preached. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God as well. Well, perhaps the greatest symbols of God's uh, protection and provision for us are found um, in the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And as we begin to prepare our hearts to celebrate the Lord's Supper today, I'm going to invite our worship team uh, to come on up um, to the platform here. You know, the, the scriptures, they, they remind us that the, the breaking of Christ's body and the shedding of his blood on the cross of Calvary have provided for our greatest spiritual need, and that is um, the forgiveness of our sins. In fact, in, in Romans 6.23, Paul says, the, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Have you ever considered the fact that actually the most dangerous road that you could ever travel is that road into eternity without the forgiveness of your sins taken care of? through Jesus' death on the cross. And this morning, as we enter into a, a time of uh, personal reflection, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've already trusted in Him for your sal salvation, let me invite you to take this time of preparation to, to thank Him for that incredible gift of forgiveness, undeserved, unmatched, built upon grace, that he made possible uh, for you, that you might not have to live 
uh, with the consequences of your sin, that you might someday be able to enter into eternity uh, with great joy and anticipation, knowing what God has prepared for you. But if you're early on in your journey of faith and just discovering what Christianity is all about, let me in- invite you this morning as, as we take this time for reflection to, uh, to consider the promise and the gift of salvation that God has made available to you in the person of Jesus Christ through his work uh, on the cross. And I want you to consider this promise uh, recorded in the scriptures um, written through uh, Paul in Romans chapter 10, where he says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe on your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What an incredible uh, promise. And if that's news to you, and if you want to learn more about that, we would love to talk more about what that means to, to receive that gift of grace, that forgiveness of sins through what Christ has done on the cross. And so we would encourage you today, after this service, talk to myself, talk to Rachel, one of our elders. We would be delighted to have that conversation and to, to share more fully what that is all about. But for now, wherever you're at in your journey of faith, let's bow our hearts. Let's spend some time before God. If there's sin in our lives, let's ask God to reveal that so we can confess that. And um, if you're new to this journey of faith, reflect on that promise of Romans 10. Let's bow our hearts together. At Bay Park, we have an uh, open communion table, which means that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, we invite you to join us in um, recognizing these sacred symbols of um, Jesus' death on the cross and what they accomplished uh, for you and I. And if you are um, just early on in your journey of faith, um, as we celebrate this sacred aspect of our faith tradition, we invite you just to observe um, and to um, encounter the the significance, the richness of these symbols uh, this morning. And as we prepare to do that, Rachel, would you give thanks for the, the bread and the cup? Father, we thank you. There's some times we just can respond with awe and wonder and thankfulness. And so we thank you that you demonstrated your provision to Elijah with the bread and meat provided by the ravens. And even that is a little picture of how you have provided for us and how in you, through your work, Jesus, your death, burial, and resurrection, we can have freedom from sin. We can have new life in you. We can have a relationship with the God of the universe we can cry out and call Abba, Father. And so I just invite you where you are in your pew, maybe as you're holding the bread and cup, to spread your hand out in front of you and even maybe look at it and remember that for you, Jesus went to the cross. His hand or wrist was pierced. His side was pierced. And he died a sinner's death. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again. And so, Jesus, we remember 
that not only your death and burial, but we praise you for your resurrection. And so we thank you for this way that we can remember your work on the cross. And would it take root in our hearts and lives? As we take this bread and cup, would we remember that you are our sustainer, our provider, and the one who gives us healing and a relationship with God? In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And the scriptures tell us, um, yeah, if you need a communion cup and wafer, one of our ushers is on either side. Just put up your hands and we'll make sure we get them to you. The scriptures uh, remind us that on the, the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's share in the bread together. After the meal, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup represents the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. He said, do this in remembrance of me. For every time you eat the bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim my death until I come. Let's proclaim Christ's death until he comes together. And now let's bow in praise and thanksgiving for this incredible gift. Lord, we're humbled by the fact that you were willing to send your own son, your one and only beloved son to this earth to leave heaven and all that is good and right and to enter into the, the messiness and the, the harm and the pain of life on this earth. And though he lived this, this perfect life, his life ended on this cross. Why? As a gift to us, as a provision for our sin, that we might not have to face the consequences of eternal death and suffering for our sin, but instead receive the, the gift of eternal life. And so we praise you this morning. We thank you for the unimaginable gift that is ours through the gift of your Son to us in Jesus Christ. We worship you and thank you for that gift which makes us possible to navigate whatever detour in life we find ourselves facing with hope and encouragement and peace. And we give thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tim. In response, we're going to stand and sing one last song. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll,
We have reflected this morning on what God has done for us through his sacrifice of his son during communion, and also about our response to God's calling on our lives through Elijah and his obedience to God, even through situations that went outside of his comfort zone. So as we go from here, thinking about what God is calling us to individually, let us heed the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, which say, Remain alert. Keep standing firm in your faith. Keep on being courageous and strong. Enjoy the day and have a good week as you expect and attempt great things for God. <laughs>